inclusion, empowerment, and representation is, is hands down the only way forward that we can tackle the challenges that we have globally. The lack of transparency, the lack of um, visibility is, is really harmful for um, diversity, inclusion, and just creating any, any equal space. When I started off, and when I see artists start off, that they just need access and a network um, in conversation and a mentor. So there's like, you know, you see a lot of mentoring schemes happening right now. Pop Culture 2021, it's my first time. Who's been here the whole three days? Okay, who's been here for two days? Who's been here only today? All right, and for everyone on stage, is this your first time at Pop Culture? Yes. Your first time, yeah? No. You mean like first time this year? Um, no, first time ever. Oh, no, 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 I've been. You've been, okay, great, so it's, it's nice to have I live about two streets from here, so <laughs> there's very little reason to not be here, so. So, um, does Pop Culture always take place here at France Club? Okay, good to know, good to know. All right, Obviously well. in the entire, yeah. The okay, whole. yeah, at the whole um, Kulturbrauerei. Okay, well, we are so happy to be here today um, to talk about diversity in the workplace. I'm sure you've heard the buzzwords, quotas, gender pay gap, systemic change, tokenism, allyship, decision makers, mental health, job descriptions, and so much more. The list of buzzwords around diversity goes on and on and, and on, and I'm sure that some of you could even be adding more to this list. Diversity in the workplace, it's currently being treated almost to the degree of perhaps data protection or is as heavy as an agenda point like sustainability, at least in my bubble, in the way that I'm seeing it right now. So whether it's in the film industry or it's in startups or it's directly here in the music industry, we're seeing the term diversity pop up left and right. And I think that everyone here can agree that since the global rise of Black Lives Matter last year, uh, which actually started back in 2011, companies have also been feeling an increased urge to you know, really implement um, diversity strategies. So um, just because we're a relatively small audience, I would love to hear from everybody here um, how you are engaged and um, what it is that you're doing. So perhaps a um, show of hands, who here is self-employed? Raise your hand. Okay, we have like three and a half, makes sense. Who here is an entrepreneur? Yeah, join in, Claudia. I know that you're an entre entrepreneur, as am I. Um, who works with an organization? Okay, so that's the other half there and two others. So it's a relatively equal distribution. Um, and I think that all of us can also attest to seeing this change and this trend somehow of diversity. We've seen so many new titles being um, given as diversity officers, but also pledges or also just anti-racism initiatives um, taking place on LinkedIn, um, but also obviously across different organizations. Um, but the question really is, what stands behind A, these fancy titles, B, the bold claims, and C, the black squares posted on Instagram? What is really working, what isn't? And how do we achieve real change to create workspaces that are welcoming of all identities? This talk today will look into the topic of diversity in the workplace. And in 30 minutes or so, uh, we won't be able to go through everything, but we will share different experiences from different ecosystems, different industries, um, along with best practices, perhaps even some worst practices, and more. My name is Yolanda Roter. I'm the co-founder of The Impact Company, which is a diversity consulting business. 
And our goal is to make a business case for why diversity impacts a company's bottom line. Besides that, I am also a moderator. I work with the Stiftung Zukunft Berlin, and I'm a born and bred Berliner. Um, enough about me. I would love for the expert of panels I have here on stage to briefly introduce them th themselves, and I would start with Claudia Schwartz. Sure, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, my name is Claudia Schwartz. I'm also born and bred in Berlin. Um, what else? <laughs> what am I doing? Um, I am the co-founder, so my background is in uh, comparative cultural studies. Um, I've worked in the music and film industry for a number of years, um, and I've transitioned to innovation and tech about eight years ago. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the US um, and in Berlin and a number of other cities in Europe. Um, yeah, and I co-founded the Federal Association for Music Technology in Germany. Um, I co-founded a company called German Innovation, um, which is a uh, sort of collaborative network that promotes German-based, uh, Germany-based innovators, creatives, digital natives, um, and all those entrepreneurs and uh, with a focus on uh, tech for good, human-centered technology, um, as well as sustainability and, and diversity empowerment. Um, what else, what did I forget? Oh yeah, and I also work in, I uh, have a company that uh, is an innovation catalyst for creative technology, which is basically uh, anything um, in the cultural and creative industries at the intersection of innovation and technology. Um, and I'm a co-founder or co-founding member of Music Women Germany, which I don't know if, if anyone uh, knows, have heard of them. Um, which is a, also a network that promotes uh, women uh, and female identifying and non-binary persons in the music industry in Germany and beyond. But enough, I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much and it's great to have you here with us, Claudia. Thank you. Um, Jin, it would be so great for you to introduce yourself next. Yeah, sure. Um, hi, my name is Jin. I'm, I'm born and raised Korean. I've been working with uh, at BMG Music Company in HR for the last six years or so. Currently, my role is to help people learn and develop professionally and personally, and I love doing that. Um, yeah, pleasure to be here. Thank you. Excited to have you here. Thank you so much. And last but definitely not least, Sandira, it would be great for you to introduce yourself. Sure. Um, I, uh, my name is Sandira Blass. Um, I am also Korean <laughs> and half Guamanian, uh, American, um, and I moved across seven cities, landed in Berlin. Happy about that. Um, my background is in music tech and music business. So I spent 20 years working with artists um, in companies. I'm currently the director of industry relations uh, at Factory Berlin, so I take care of partnership portfolios. Um, and a little context about Factory so that it makes sense about my perspective today is that we're a community of 4,000 members um, that come from 70 nations. We have 150 startups, 20 corporates, and 15 partners, and members like the Impact Company as well. Um, and we even have a university, Code University, uh, in, a, in a junior high, high school based, uh, project based learning school called New School. So in our space, we have people from 12 to 60 years old on campus, which is quite unique. Um, and I, yeah, um, that's kind of the gist, I guess, about myself. So, yeah. yeah, thank you so much. And it's great to have you here with us, Sandira. I'm so excited to have this talk here at Pop Kultur, and especially to have it in person. Um, Claudia, I think you were saying that this is one of your first talks um, in 15 months. So it's just great for all of us to be I here. I super excited about the yeah, um, fantastic. So let's start and let's get right into it. Um, you know, we, we've been talking about diversity being associated with so many buzzwords, but it's also an umbrella term for a lot of different things. And so I think to get everyone on the right page, on the same page, would be great for each of us to define what diversity means to us and our organizations. So um, I'm happy to just give a brief start. Um, to me, diversity means having representation um, across all levels of an organization. It also means that um, diversity is definitely not easy. It's um, relatively difficult um, or challenging and therefore needs a um, sustained breath and lots of action um, when you're trying to bring together different ethnicity, race, gender, socioeconomic classes, sexual orientation, and nationalities. Um, but it's definitely worth the fight. 
that's it on my end. I would love to hear, what do you think, Jen? What does diversity mean for you? <laughs> It'll be lying if I, um, I, I have to admit I've grown a little tired of this term, uh, as everybody has probably. Um, I can give you a corporate answer, uh, which I've memorized to my heart, but uh, to me it means very little if it's not uh, accompanied by tangible actions, um, setting sustainable structures and processes to make an actual difference in, in the society. And um, yeah, and it should be treated in which in, in individual contexts. But just diversity itself, I guess for many people, I represent diversity to some degree. Uh, all of us probably do to some degree. Um, but it should be more than that. It should be more than just individual people um, representing something that other people project on you. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think we're gonna be um, taking that up later in the conversation around the structures and the systemic change that you're talking about, um, that it can't be just on one person. But um, yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, Claudia, are you also tired of the term diversity? Oh, for sure, yeah. <laughs> um, I kind of want to tackle that question from a sort of a different angle. I think, you know, inclusion, empowerment, and representation is, is hands down the only way forward that we can tackle the challenges that we have globally. So um, I would love to move beyond the point of discussing whether this is an issue. And this is now kind of included more perspectives. And a couple of years ago, I've been frequently invited to panels to speak about women in the workplace. And it's like, can we please talk about everyone who's underrepresented from yeah, starting now? But it's like, oh, let's start with the women and then we'll tackle the other groups. And like, what is it, like, what are we wasting this time for? So I, I definitely, this needs to go way beyond. And this is uh, sort of why I'm, I'm very happy about the, the focus of the panel or the talk today. Um, how do we drive this change? How do we, you know, uh, kind of retain a positive, uh, attitude, a positive work environment, and, and not discussing whether or not this is necessary or if it's time yet, you know, is it time yet mm -hmm. to, to be this inclusive? So it's it's the only way forward, and, and all the challenges globally, professionally, um, they can only be tackled if we're inclusive as much as we can and kind of make this a normal, you know, kind of environment that everyone's being heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, the fact that you're bringing in inclusion and and inclusivity, but also intersectionality into this is um, a really important aspect to consider. Um, but yeah, before we go um, into that more, I would love to take hear your take on what diversity means to you and your organization, Sandira. For me, the three things that pop up are um, the environment and that you set yourself in, 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 in various voices, um, in various opportunities for people, um, and equal access. Um, those are the three things that always pop up, and I always think to myself, what can I do? What can my small imprint do in my company, and what can I do outside of my company? These are the three things that pop up. Yeah, um, super interesting. Um, you bring in the topic of access, you bring in the topic of space, environment, um, and I think that's where you know inclusion almost, um, sometimes becomes a little bit almost difficult to measure, per, um, perhaps because it's like a little bit invisible. Diversity, and we're gonna get into this in a moment, um, you know, can be measured in terms of surveys and polls and, you know, but inclusivity, it's really, you know, how, how are people actually feeling um, in an environment and what part are they bringing to work? What part are they perhaps leaving out of work? So I think that that's um, really interesting. And maybe we could actually go another quick round. Um, and, you know, I would like to right away um, hear from each of you, what does an inclusive workspace um, look like, feel like, um, doesn't mean that you're bringing your whole self to work. Um, yeah, I'm looking into Claudia's face. Maybe you can start. <laughs> my, my, my personal work day? <laughs> mm, your personal work day, sure. Um, but also in an ideal world, perhaps. <laughs> Any other questions for the next two minutes? Um, we got 40 minutes. <laughs> uh, got it. Well, um, let me think about this for a minute. Um, Huh. I think, you know, what, what I thought was interesting about the pandemic, and it didn't surprise me at all, is that 
it, it kind of made obvious how fragile the work, like what we've achieved collectively so far, how fragile that still is. Um, and the minute sort of we were posed with challenges that we hadn't faced before that were sort of hypothetical, but all of a sudden we have these challenges of, you know, remote work place and childcare at home and all of this, we kind of, you know, how quickly we we withdrew back to very old stereotypical, you know, separations of workplace and, and kind of role uh, assumptions. Um, and, and that to me, I think is, is super important for this conversation. Like, how do we build something that is really um, kind of hold up to the coming challenges? Like, how do we yeah, kind of prepare ourselves for, for a challenge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I always think I'm too loud, but apparently I'm not. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that's for me a really important question, like how is how real is what we've achieved actually, you know, like how much does that hold up if we have uh, challenges that we haven't faced before that we haven't anticipated? And this goes, especially because I sort of in that space of tech and, and emerging technologies, um, you know, a lot of the, the challenges in the, in the daily workplace of innovation and technology, we can't anticipate yet. You know, some of us are kind of future prototyping and we're kind of looking five years, 10 years ahead, but a lot of us are just, you know, dealing with like basic tech, technological challenges. So there's always the question of like, what are we actually working to towards to? Like it's sort of what's the future? Mm. And I think that's a, that's a really important question uh, to include the current challenges and, and some type of future prototyping of what society could look like, what a workplace could look like. And I don't have the answers for that, but I think that conversation um, is very rarely taking place currently. I think it's very much about what can we do today, which is important, but I think it needs to also include that question of what do we have to prepare ourselves for for the next five to 10 years, if not more. Yeah, um, I think, you know, you bringing up the pandemic obviously is so um, important in this whole um, development of what the work um, space is moving towards and just also shares or shed a lot of light, provide a lot of transparency, um, you know, on the intersectionality of every person who's in the working world. Um, and we had this panel talk, <clears throat> like, I think it was six weeks ago at Factory, which was um, called beyond categories. And I felt like everyone in the room could relate so much to this, um, you know, that everybody is beyond categories. And especially the pandemic has really brought that to the forefront. Um, and therefore the question around, you know, creating an inclusive workspace almost takes on a co completely new dimension um, with that now coming more, becoming much more visible. Um, perhaps Jin, since you're coming in from a um, human resources perspective, um, I'd love to hear how you dealt with um, some of these pandemic issues um, on the job itself, and also how you were able to you know, create um, an inclusive um, work environment nonetheless. Ooh, <laughs> big question. Um, in my daily work in HR, the number of conversations that I had, number of tears, if you can con count tears, it's a number of heavy conversations that I have to deal with on a daily basis that has increased exponentially in the last 18 months. I now know so much more than I would like to know about my colleagues and their personal lives, uh, what is going on. That probably goes to everybody. I just have a slightly easier access to those personal stories of people, but uh, probably that goes to everybody else. We've been looking at everyone's living rooms and bedrooms and kitchen and, uh, and all, all kinds of personal spaces. Um, the, the positive thing that I would like to uh, point out is though, I think we've all grown more careful and caring for each other um, the, the topic of neurodiversity and mental health is so much out there like never before. Um, and I think people are more respectful, uh, perhaps the, the, the distance, but also the closeness through the um, virtual life has um, brought some, some goods and some bads. Um, 
Yeah. Um, I really like where we're taking this right now. So um, just to pee back on that a little bit, um, would you say that this has, um, at the end of the day, impacted um, overall diversity and awareness for your company at large? Or for also just like, not only your company, your company being an example of other companies? One negative thing um, that I've noticed is uh, communications can now even more easily happen between closed doors, between just few decision makers. Mm -hmm. That is, that was at least you could see some, a person walking to another office to have some sort of conversation. You don't see any of that. Mm -hmm. Things can happen behind your back. Things can happen around you without anyone noticing very quickly. And just the lack of transparency, the lack of um, visibility is, is really harmful for um, diversity, inclusion, and just creating any, any equal space. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. point. May I add to yeah. that? Yeah, so I, I'm really worried looking at sort of the last year and a half, I'm really worried about the emerging professionals and emerging artists because they've not, you know, we've been in the workplace, I've been, you know, in the workplace for 20 years, over 10, 20 years almost, uh, you probably similar attended 15. Um, we've made our connections, you know, we, we have a biography, we have, you know, a network, but if you are just starting out in this industry, it's hard enough to connect, but, um, but with all the challenges of, again, like technology, innovation, future of work, different models, and if you don't have that network, and I'm really worried that um, it's not done enough to include uh, upcoming young professionals, young adults. Um, and so I'm really happy to hear the statistics how, how age diverse um, factory is kind of, you know, putting, like positioning itself. So that's, that's really good information. But I'm, I'm really worried that, you know, we need to kind of use the funding that's available. Um, and I think really have that conversation of how do we uh, support, especially people who are underrepresented and coming up you know, um, in that context, because I think there's there's so many careers kind of, you know, stopped in their beginnings or tracks, so it's really hard to reach those places, and not even talking about middle management, that's a whole different conversation, but just getting started and getting into university and, and building these networks, I think that's a really a, a super big challenge right now, and I, I don't see enough funding programs addressing this issue, um, so I, I would like to kind of, you know, encourage everyone to kind of have that conversation and like, how do we bring up people? And there, there is um, sort of a saying um, that once you've made it to the top, you know, you're you're almost required to send back down the elevator. And I kind of I thought about that the other day, um, and I really hate that that kind of quote by now because I think it's more about you you might have to go back down the stairs and p get someone on your piggy you know on your back and kind of carry them up the stairs it's not about elevators and like maybe people don't don't have the right fab to operate the elevator or don't know what level to get off right so um so i think it's really we have to you know as as women or as professionals, you know, it, there's just more work involved involved to really get those young adults and young professionals, and that doesn't necessarily mean young in, in terms of age, but just maybe just entering that that space. Um, we need to do more, and and it's, it's really comfy when you're kind of settled in, in some place of you know where we are. But so I think it's more about sending, it's, it's much more than just sending the elevator back mm -hmm. down. So. Yeah, I'm gonna to wanna to hear about factory in just a moment, but um, just to recap, so um, Jin, you've been talking about you know the um, digital dimension of the workplace really leading to a lack of visibility and therefore decision makers having more of a space even to um, you know make decisions behind closed doors and how that's harmful. Um, so I would love to, you know, in a moment go back to the topic of transparency. And then Claudia, the point that you've been making around you know, um, up and coming emerging artists, creatives, and how they're really struggling in this um, day and age in terms of building a network and just receiving the funding and that entire concept of you know who's helping who kind of ties into allyship almost also. So I'd love to go onto that in a moment as well. 
um, just like earmarking these things. Um, but at this point, I would also love to hear, you know, factory um, as a co-working space, as an ecosystem. Um, from what I understand, you were able to remain open throughout the majority of the pandemic. Um, how did you see a change in who came through the doors, but also how did you see that really still encourage um, a sense of community and a sense of perhaps even transparency and just um, networking? Yeah, for sure. Um, we, we did remain open under really strict measures. Um, it'd be in the past that we'd have a thousand people come through, but now we have like only a hundred. I think in terms of transparency, we were able to be one-on-one -on -one more with members and people and to hear feedback um, and to also discuss this openly with the the top um, like leaders in our company um, and yeah we were able to you know host events and um, definitely I see that we you know uh, we we're able to also uh, mentor more people mm -hmm. and I think that ties back to what you were saying Claudia about how uh, people coming or just starting um, or even younger people um, it goes back to your first question of like access and opportunities mm -hmm. and I uh, is definitely a space where we try to foster that and to give everyone an empowering network. I, I feel like when I started off and when I see artists start off, that they just need access and a network um, in conversation and a mentor. So there's like, you know, you see a lot of mentoring schemes happening right now. Um, this is something that we also do with our female and uh, underrepresented and non-binary founders program called Stealth Mode. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely see a change in the way we work and... Um, even the panel that you present was the best panel I ever uh, attended in my life, and uh, you opened with uh, the. You changed my uh, a lot of us uh, in the in the audience when you asked, uh, "What do you do?" Um, this really changed the way we work, actually, and how we introduce now. Okay. We were like, you know, I hate I hate saying, "What do you do?" I mean, I, I I'm an I guess you can say I'm an ambassador for for people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and. Um, yeah, there was a lot of time during this pandemic to to get to know people like you and, and our partner, Black Bound Berlin, um, who's really helped establish and change yeah. and rejig our organization. And in our organization, what's really key here and unique for me is that we have corporates and startups and big names. And for them to go to these talks and hear uh, in this small setting um, what is really going on, what's the problem, problem out there in Europe or in Germany or in globally, uh, really <laughs> was quite unique and special for me. Mm. I think, yeah, that talk was nice. on interdisciplinarity too, yeah. it was like in the word diversity, how we're, we're tired of, yeah. of this word. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like there are certain, you know, ecosystems that are very special and have been able to, you know, stand out perhaps during the pandemic um, but also just in terms of, you know, creating a sense of diversity and bringing together, um, you know, a very um, large range of people um, and communities. Um, and, but of course, that's in many cases just not given for un very underrepresented communities or those who don't have the financial resources even um, or just generally the access um, to even you know, knowing about a place like this. Um, but it's it's a good, you know, example to um, look at. And I think that one thing that perhaps um, we could also just highlight in this um, conversation, in this part of the conversation right now, is that Factory, beyond just being a space, also has, like, a digital um, space and that I'm sure I wasn't part of at that time, but I'm sure it was, like, thriving very much during the pandemic to or during the, the height of lockdown. So, um, but yeah, that's an existing network that also, you know, begs the question how to create even more access, how to get perhaps even, you know, more up, up and coming emerging artists, creatives involved. All right, um, going back to the question around transparency um, or the topic of transparency. One thing that I mentioned very much at the beginning was the gender pay gap. And I would like to know from um, any of you what your take on you know, transparency could be in really moving forward, moving the needle along. Like, do we need to 
demand wages and prices um, to be laid open, laid public, in order to um, create less of a discrepancy between the highest performing and the lowest paid um, individuals. Um, do you think that that would make a difference? And I see you nodding your head, Jin. That's why I'm going to ask you to, you know, especially from an HR perspective, talk about, you know, what's going on there. It will make a difference if we all knew what everyone was earning uh, based on one fact. I cannot wholly foresee what kind of change it will bring. Uh, many people will, force, will be forced into uh, a defense or some sort of explanation for their worth. And some people will be furious about how much their worth is in a monetary term. Um, yeah, but it's, it's important. It's, uh, if it's not transparent, we will never know. We'll never know. If we don't know, we will never be able to fix it. So, yes? Okay. <laughs> yeah, Claudia, do you want to add something to that? Uh, sure, yeah, I think uh, this, this also ties back with, ally, with the topic of allyship. I think, you know, if there's, I mean, if, if you have to ask for it and not be asked to, or not be offered more pay, but you have to ask for it, like, maybe we're, we're starting the conversation at the wrong point. Like, you know, if, if there was true allyship sort of in a workplace or in a team, that conversation would be totally different, I think. So I think that's really important to, to focus on those topics as well. Like, how do you really create an inclusive workspace, you know, on all levels of management? Um, uh, but it's qu it's quite interesting. I mean, the I think empowerment is, plays a big role in this as well. Um, there's a statistics that statistic that um, women ask for 50% less pay, just like sort of across the board. Um, and one of my um, early mentors ba back in the day, um, she said, you know, if you're asking for or if if you're being asked like what your salary, you know, ideal salary would be you kind of think of a number that makes you laugh and then you go slightly lower. And I, I think that's a really good advice. I haven't managed to do that, but I think it's really good advice for all of the young people in the audience. Yeah. And I see this new generation sort of 10 years younger or 15 years younger than I am. And they're like really asking for, I'm like, I wasn't that bold. So I'm, I'm really applauding this across, you know, not just women, but like everyone who's been underrepresented and, and not sort of appreciated enough. Um, so really go for it. But I, I think it's, it's sort of a combination of transparency, but allyship on all different levels and just a, a general attitude as a company and what you want to be and what kind of future you want to go into with your team members. And it, it also brings up the question of retention. So it, it's really nice to have these statistics of how many diverse you know, people you kind of hired, but how many people are staying in your company. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly true for, for the tech world where I'm currently mostly you know, spending most of my time. Um, it's it used to be a pipeline problem, so not enough people were studying in that field to go into these into these um, companies or into these into this area. Uh, but now it's really a question of there there are enough people going into the field and kind of feeling you know excited about those topics, uh, but they then face a toxic work culture um, that's not you know making them you know kind of stay. And this is very true for the entertainment industry, you know. What do you do? Like both equally for parents of both sexes, like or of all sexes, uh, like how um, how do you combine sort of a family life with you know touring with you know 15, 18 hour work days? It's it's nuts. Like and that that needs to change, and that that goes for everyone involved, sort of who has a family you know structure wants to have a life work balance. So I think there, there are so many more topics on, on top of this. How do we create sort of the future of work? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, there's so many different topics to dig into this um, right now that you said, but I think it's so good um, to talk about this toxic work culture because that's exactly the op like lies before basically creating diverse, inclusive, empowering workspace that is also caring and has like a sense of vulnerability for all of us to show up um, and have this welcome, um, you know, or just to bring our full selves and actually 
yeah, uh, then at the end of the day, um, meet whatever visions, goals we want to meet. Um, the question is, or the second part of the panel um, is entitled, or the talk is entitled, um, how to drive change. So the question really is how, what instruments can we use to diminish, get rid of this toxic work culture? Um, and there's a few things that come to my mind right away in terms of you know recognizing one's own privilege, looking at unconscious bias, um, and also you know just you know seeing the structures who is being hired. You're talking about recruiting and retention, um, enlarging that pool. Um, but still, we we're still seeing a lot of toxic work environments um, today. And the question then also can be even more pinpointed towards cancel culture. Are we, who are we canceling out? Um, and who are we actually giving another chance? And I would like to hear from you all what that learning curve kind of involves and where you draw a line and where you say, no way, can, no, no more boo-boos, this cannot go, this is it. Um, I don't know if, anyone has an example or wants to share an experience that you have or has a take on this rather wordy question? <laughs> this, this is a really tough questions, even though they sound kind of basic, but, and I'm thinking about what you said and I'm still, it's resonating on me and what you said, Claudia, and then to tie off that, um, why, why is it that we have this problem that we even have to ask this question about transparency in the workplace? We, went, we know what the problem is, <clears throat> but if you want stats, because some people are just stats people, like Boston Consulting Group released this analytics about um, how the global economy could boost by uh, $5.4 trillion if we just had equal with uh, female and male and non-binary or underrepresented is in this category um, with the privileged community. Um, you know, and the only way to do that is for us to um, to create initiatives internally. Like when when you ask that question to Claudia, I think, what can I do at my company? Uh, it starts with like management. They have key influence and control of a business, and to let me have leadership inside the company, or to have let anyone empower them to have um, an opportunity to to create programs. Uh, mentorship programs to connect people to uh, to highlight uh, companies and artists, um, I think, is key. Um, um, but re regarding your question, maybe I got off the topic because I did want to to contribute to that um, about curves. Mm -hmm. um, was that regarding the question about um, the leaders in the organization yeah. accountability versus going through? Um, you know, there's a lot of things happening in town with like. Um, regarding spaces, uh, maybe close to getting shut down or whatever, or have been in the past globally, um, or calls that people uh, have, people only, you know, when, when, when something bad happens or mishap, then they have to close shop. And I think there's an opportunity also with a response to a call of how you can uh, resolve a situation. Um, and that says a lot to a lot of us, especially under represented people, people of color, female, non-binary, whoever, you know, um, trans community, it says a lot when you, when you say, you know, uh, we resolve this problem by getting rid of blah, blah, you know? And so um, instead of X, Y, Z, um, but I definitely think that there's, uh, we, you know, just having like a, um, a workshop in, in the company is not good enough. Um, what can you do with an action point after that that you can do? Um, or personally, what can you do outside? What, who can you help? Um, what can you do for the communities? Um, I think, yeah, there's, it's, uh, I don't know how to completely answer the question, no. but definitely it's, uh, yeah, um, it's pretty difficult. Go for it. Yeah, I, I, I love what you, a couple of points. It's amazing that sort of how to ties in with other stuff that we mentioned. Um, I think for me, an important issue, uh, especially in German culture, culture in Germany, is that we're really lacking in terms of a feedback culture and like sort of we're, we're not really, especially in management, it's just not very common to be sort of open to critique from people who've just joined the company or who are sort of lower or middle, you know, sort of positions. And it's, and that's, that's a little different, I think, in the tech world a little bit because it's a younger space and it's people kind of are forming companies with a different mindset to begin with and other companies, especially in the music and film industry, um, they just have such a 
you know, sort of massive history of, you know, building and growing as a company and um, in, in a completely different, sort of different era of, of, you know, how we treated each other in, in the workplace, especially underrepresented um, uh, groups. Um, so I think that's important to, as an artist with, you know, your professional network, whether that's your label or management or publisher, to kind of demand that. And if you don't get that respect, and that's the same in the workplace, if you don't get that respect or if you don't have shared values, you move on. You're not, no longer tied to that structure. There are so many different ways of building a career these days that you don't need to bear that environment. And it baffles me, and I don't want to diss, you know, labels or major, especially major labels, but it, it just baffles me to, to, to an extent that still the majority of young artists are looking for a major label contract. It's just, I don't understand it at all, coming from a music tech sort of background. Um, so look where you can find different, you know, again, allies, different connections where you can maybe learn about technology or innovation uh, on your own or together with other people that you who are in your network um, to be more independent and sort of find shared values with with a network and not you know kind of yeah be sort of yeah exposed to those elements of tox toxicity um, and the other point is accountability like you know you really have to if you're being hired and you're being promised things and they're not being kept and you remind people you know we discussed something else when you hired me you know if that doesn't change then you know make a decision move on we're no longer in a place where your professional biography has to be super straight mm -hmm. you know and this is also a very german issue that you know my mother worked at the same place for 35 years it's just it's unimaginable to me like it's i would get bored like <laughs> you know um so there, there's so many different ways of how we create our lives, especially professionally. Um, you know, be bold and kind of look for the people who you connect with and have shared values, and if they hold your, you know, people who hire you and promise you stuff accountable. I think it's important. Yeah, thank you so much for um, these wonderful contributions. I am looking at the time, um, and it looks like we're over time. Um, if somebody from the back could give me a sign, I'm happy to continue. Don't see anything. Um, but yeah, I think we're just gonna have to slowly but surely wrap it up. Um, it's been very, very insightful um, in terms of the different areas. Um, it's been, I think, way too short of a conversation. I would think everybody here in the audience agrees we could continue um, talking about this. And I'm glad that you, you know, just also, again, just to wrap it up, um, we just brought on the topic of accountability. We also talk, talked about shared values and at the end of the day, building one's own table um, to a certain degree. And just seeing um, that as a possibility and an, as an opportunity. Um, of course, there's an element of risk there versus the element of um, security and stability, but I do um, think that times call for that right now and um, that that is a way to you know, enable diversity, um, empower more diverse structures, build those structures that we want to see. Um, yeah, so much to that. Um, Jin, would you still like to say one last thing or? <laughs> Um, how much time do we have? <laughs> do we have time for questions from the audience? I would yeah. love. Uh, Are there any? You have one comment? I have one comment um, uh, while that? you think of yours, unless you have yours. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, whatever you're trying to do, think about not just a snapshot. Getting the data, for example, diversity data is, is a hot topic. Not just think about snapshots, but something that could represent what continues. Do, feel, do people feel belonged, trusted, um, supported? Um, yeah, I, I just don't look at the snapshot because that's what many people have been doing and we've seen people trying to just do one thing that they can put out there. Um, but change and 
setting up processes and structures uh, that's for sustainable change. So not just think about whatever policy or guideline, whatever you're trying to set up. Is it working just for the next couple of months? Is it working for perhaps wherever, uh, at least for a couple of years? Are we listening to our people enough? Um, those are the questions that I would like to give. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm, I put myself uh, at risk every day at my job um, by speaking up and I think that everyone should use their platform whether you have access to to book or to recommend someone who has a voice like Yolanda um, to speak or these ladies um, and I think uh, also I wanted to have a takeaway for artists because I know this is pop couture um, there's billions of dollars of funding in Europe uh, through EC that artists who are musicians don't know they have access to um, and it's, there's great companies like uh, there's there's uh, Music Board Berlin who has totally supported many artists like every artist I've met in Berlin. But come see me if you have interest in finding um, funding. If you have trouble um, getting unlocking a potential of six figures to up to a million of funding, there is a way to do it. It's through collaborations through other industries um, that you may not know about. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. I think that that's a really great call to action. Um, everybody do reach out to Sandira Blas via factory. Um, also feel free to reach out to Claudia Schwartz um, and uh, Jin Lee um, if you're looking for more, um, building more of a network, um, but also in terms of funding and getting access to different resources and also just to continue picking our brains. This is one conversation. It's not ending here, it's continuing. And um, I would love for all of us to continue this conversation off stage. Um, yeah, so enjoy the rest of your time here at Pop Kultur and speak to you shortly. Thank you. Thank you.